everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You are listening to It's All About Food. Sometimes the times we're in seem like the craziest ever. And yet, human history has had some spectacular ups and downs. And when things seem insurmountable, when the violence seems so great, when everything that I don't believe in seems to be gaining great power, it's very easy to get depressed. It's very easy to not be motivated to work on what is important, the activism. And so sometimes the words of writers can be very helpful. I'm looking right now at the words of Howard Zinn, the American historian, from something that was published back in 2004. I'm going to read a portion of it that has really been powerful for me, especially this week. To be hopeful in bad times is not being foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of competition and cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something if we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, it energizes us to act and raises at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents, and to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. And so, with those words in mind, we continue our work. And there is much to be done while the world, or at least the United States, is focusing on two presidential candidates, and I'm, I'm not telling you to ignore anything that's going on. I think it's a very important election, and the outcome of it is, is probably going to make tremendous differences in all of our lives. But putting that aside for the moment, we still have hunger. We still have food insecurity. We still have billions of animals suffering in industrial agriculture call it factory farms, call it what you may. These are things that need to change. And when we're talking about hunger for a moment, you may be aware of the UN's goal to create a world free of hunger by 2030. Reading from a link at the UN.org, Sustainable Development on Hunger, they note that the global issue of hunger and food insecurity has shown an alarming increase since 2015. A lot of this is due to the pandemic, conflict, climate change, deepening inequalities around the world. Approximately 735 million people, or 9.2% of the world's population, found themselves in 2022 in a state of chronic hunger, which was a staggering rise compared to 2019. So the UN had this goal to create a world free of hunger by 2013. It is now 2024. That goal is not going to be reached. Extreme hunger and malnutrition impact so many things on this planet. When you're hungry, when you're malnourished, it affects everything in your life. When you're a young child, it affects how you grow and learn. It affects your brain development. And it's very difficult to escape a situation like this. And not only do people need access to food, they need access to nutritious food. We have a corporate global food system today that is creating ultra-processed food of little nutrition. So while we're on the subject of hunger. There is a new report that has come out that I want to link in this post 
and I hope you all read it. It's called Food from Somewhere, Building Food Security and Resilience Through Territorial Markets. It's put together by the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. They've put out numerous reports that are all excellent. And while there's still so much work to be done, and as I said when I opened, the current state of the country, the world, the planet, can be overwhelming. Sometimes it's important to reflect on what has come before us. We recently lost two great leaders, Dr. John McDougall, a whole food plant-based medical doctor, who was one of the original people in our lifetime promoting a healthy plant diet. Stephen M. Wise, the attorney who founded the Non-Human Rights Project, he passed back in February, and he's responsible for work for the legal rights of non-human animals, working to have animals that are in captivity recognized as legal persons. I decided for today's program to re-air the interview I had with Dr. John McDougall back in 2016 and the interview I had with Stephen M. Wise that same year. Both are from eight years ago. Both are still very current, very important. So here they are, remembering Dr. John McDougall and Stephen M. Wise. There's always a bright side to look at everything that's going on, and uh, even though the planet is warming up, we should take advantage of the beautiful weather that we have when we have it. I'm especially enjoying breathing today. You know, I like to talk about breathing, and I woke up in, this morning, and the air was just so incredibly sweet, and I hope it is where you are. Okay, I'm very excited about this. I'm going to bring on my guest for the day, Dr. John McDougall. He is a board-certified physician and nutrition expert who teaches better health through vegetarian cuisine. Dr. McDougall has been studying writing and speaking out about the effects of nutrition on disease for over 30 years. Dr. John and Mary McDougall believe that people should look and feel great for a lifetime. Welcome to It's All About Food, Dr. McDougall. Well, thank you. You know, I might as well just continue your discussion. Uh, there's one card to play if we're going to save planet Earth, and it has to be played now, and that's the food card. Because unless we play the food card, we can't play the other cards, which are transportation and energy. We just, we just don't have time to do it. Yep. Uh, the food card, and I have, for your listeners, I don't know, that may be new to you, the food card would be changing our source of calories from livestock, pigs, cows, chickens, fishes, to a source of calories of starch, which is potatoes, corn, rice, beans, peas, and lentils. Uh, with that change, overnight we can reduce greenhouse gas production by over 50%. I mean, there are estimates that food-related uh, grease and greenhouse gas productions could be dropped 70% overnight. Uh, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about changing the diet that we eat in New York City and Atlantic City and Shanghai and a, a diet based on you know cows and pigs and chickens and dairy products and so on back to the traditional diet people ate 35 years ago in China. Mm. Or, uh, you know, 35 years ago in South America, and that's a diet based on rice. 90% of the, of, the, of the calories in China came from rice before 1980, or potatoes before uh, 1980 in South America. Uh, probably 90% of the food came from potatoes. So that's what we have to do. If you want to fix the planet, you want to, you want to save uh, what we have for our children and grandchildren, which is my primary motivation these days in life, we have to play the food card. Well, I am right there with you, and I've committed my life to this to this mission. I, I just wanted to say, before we dig in a little deeper, how you and Mary want to help people look and feel great. I, I have um, the promotional picture of you. Uh, and I'm, you, I'm almost 70. You are looking so <laughs> great. You know, you, I, the, the next cover of the book will have Mary's picture on it, too. 
Uh, she's 70 years old. She's more beautiful every day. We've yeah. been together for 45 years. And I really do mean that. I, you know, I used to hear that when I was a kid. Uh, people talk about their spouses who were you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years older than me, and they would say things like, you know, she's more beautiful every day. And I mm. think, oh, you got to be crazy. And now here, Mary and I are 70. And I look across uh, the table at her, and I go, you know, she's more beautiful every day. Oh, you're bringing tears to my eyes. Uh, well, it's it's true, you know. There's something about getting older. You find out some things that you try and share with younger people. It works out sometimes. <laughs> it works out sometimes. <laughs> now, I've heard you speak many, many times um, back in the 90s, uh-huh. and um, what I always loved was that you had this fire in your belly. Oh, yeah, it's still there. And it's still there. I just read The Healthiest Diet on the Planet, and I'm like, nothing has changed. And no. so what keeps it burning? You're telling, your story has been the same pretty uh-huh. much for decades. Years. Yeah. yeah, how do you feed that fire? Well, you know, it's, it's of course, my, my basic personality and makeup and the fact that I was given... Uh, a great lead in life by having a, an amazing father and a very nice mother, too. But, uh, you know, all that gave me kind of the background, the inborn personality and the uh, the guidance of uh, very honest parents. It gave me a background so that when I discovered something that I thought was extremely important, which is why 80% of the people in this country are sick and how to cure them, uh, I discovered that back in... Uh, my medical residency, which was between 1976 and 1978, it it gave me a passion in life because I'm a doctor. You know, I wanted to help people, and that's really all I wanted to do. I just wanted to cure type 2 diabetes and reverse heart disease and slow and stop and reverse cancers and all things that I knew were true based on the scientific research. I wanted to help my patients. So that's why I became a doctor. That's why the other people in your audience who are dietitians and physicians and, you know, have other health care uh, positions in life. That's why they went into the business too, was to help their customer, because you know, it makes you feel good in return. Well, that was all my motivation back 40 years ago, and I've been very successful at what I do as a doctor. Uh, but I also became uh, interested later on. I wasn't an issue. I'll tell you the truth. I had no sympathy at all for uh, animal rights and the cruelty of animals. And as I grew. You know, as, as my eyes were opened, I realized that. And then about 20 years ago, I realized uh, that, you know, the only the only chance we have of saving the planet is to fix the food. Mm-hmm. So I've been kind of focused on that now. And, and when people ask me, well, how do I still got to get out of bed in the morning and <laughs> have a big smile and, and enthusiasm is because I have seven grandchildren. Mm. They have no future. And wherever I go, I try and tell that story. Yeah, I, I can cure your diabetes. That's no problem. I can, I can cure your heart disease and give you a good bowel movement. That's no problem. <laughs> but what we've got to do is so much more important than that. Uh, and everybody knows it. And we have people like Elon Musk talking about sending everybody to Mars and or some people to Mars. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, of uh, high-flying I- I- ideas out there about what we're going to do. But they're not practical mm-hmm. from my viewpoint like it is to take and tell people to start eating potatoes and rice again. <laughs> you know, you can build a spaceship and go to Mars, but excuse me, I'd rather just stay here. You know, I'm in California, kind of like it. I don't want to go to Mars. <laughs> how, we don't know how the windsurfing's going to be on Mars, right? Yeah, uh, well, they, well, I don't know. I hear all these stories, but maybe they'll have some good wind. <laughs> okay. The unfortunate thing, I mean, there's many unfortunate things, but as you were learning and your eyes were opening about what really creates health and and what creates disease Uh, countries outside of the united states as you mentioned um were starting to adopt the standard american diet and over the next few generations started to have diabetes that didn't exist before and heart disease that didn't exist before as they were adopting our diets and uh, it's very frustrating to see even though as some of us have this knowledge we're still yeah. sharing the wrong information. Yeah, I think I think China is a great example. Uh, before 1980, they had no obesity, no type two diabetes. Virtually didn't exist. You can find all this published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in the year 2013. They looked, did the uh, evaluation of the health of the Chinese population. And before 1980, when 90% of their diet was rice, it was white rice, but they still did well on white rice. Uh, before 1980, people were really healthy, and then China became an economic giant. 
And now they brag, and they do brag, that uh, 12% of the population is frankly diabetic and half are pre-diabetic, wow. and obesity is rampant. The uh, same thing ha- happens, has happened in India at the same time. It used to be only the high-class, the high-tier uh, people on the continent of India were fat and diabetic and sick. And now uh, it came out last year that the middle class in the continent of India, they also have attained the same poor health as the high class. So it's just spreading worldwide uh, as people have access because of fossil fuel and because of uh, technologies that we've developed. As people have access to all this rich food, uh, everybody can eat like a king and a queen, and they get fat and sick like kings and queens, and, you know, they're dying, their families are dying, uh, the planet is dying, and I don't know. I don't know how you fix it. There's got to be some way to make it profitable to do the right thing. And so far, very few people have figured out how to make money doing the right thing. Well, let's talk about that because there are some businesses now that are promoting an, a plant-based diet, but they're creating highly processed foods made from yeah. plants, and that's where the investments that's- are. Yeah, that's, 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 of course, a growing business to make a veggie burger look like a bloody beef burger. You know, there's companies it that doesn't do that. even taste good. Uh, uh, so it, it's the wrong message. Uh, we shouldn't be eating. Well, we got to listen to my words carefully because I don't really mean exactly what I, I'm saying. Uh, we shouldn't be our focus of attention shouldn't be eating a vegan or vegetarian diet because vegan diets can be they can be oil and fake meats and fake cheeses and you know there are too many fat sick vegans out there. Our focus of attention needs to be to obtain the bulk of our calories from starch. Like traditionally, I told you just a minute ago, people did. You obtain most of your food, 90%, 70%, probably 90% of your calorie intake from traditional foods like potatoes and, you know, corn like the Mayans and the Aztecs or the people of the corn. I like potatoes. I like corn. You know, (laughs) but the reason that people like potatoes is because that's the food for human beings. If you ask the question... Uh, you know, what does a cat eat? Well, a cat's a carnivore, eats meat. You know, I have a little cat that's on the porch right now, and he mm-hmm. brings me little birds and Aww. little little uh, moles and little rodents every day with a big smile on his face, and he thinks that I'm going to be happy, but I keep telling him. I keep saying, Einstein, that's not my food. And I turn around and offer him a, big, a baked potato, and he looks up at me, and he thinks, <laughs> hey, Dad, that's not my food. <laughs> you know, cat's I tell name people, is Einstein? His cat's name is Einstein. Yeah, he's their last pet. <laughs> So, you know, what I would want to see, yeah, okay, you can go vegan, vegetarian, whatever you want to call it. Whole food, plant-based nutrition is a great you know, great word used, but it doesn't really tell people no. what they need to eat. They, you, you need to eat starch. You are a starch or a starchitarian. Uh, you're a starch eater, and, you know, you live in New York, and so you have all kinds of ethnic different mm-hmm. ethnic populations, and they can stop right now on this radio show. Right now when they're listening, they can stop and say, huh, you know, that's what my grandma and grandpa ate. Mm-hmm. You know, my parents are from Thailand, and they all, you know, that's what they ate. They were never overweight, and never had diabetes. Or My parents, uh, they're from uh, Mexico or Central America, and they lived on corn and beans, and nobody was sick or fat. Or, you know, so all of your listeners out there, if they just stop for a minute and think, back about their childhood, their grandma, their grandpa, what they ate, and what's happened in these, you know, 35, 50, 70 years of time, they go, aha, this is no mystery why people are sick. This is no mystery why we're destroying the planet and, and things aren't going right and why the biggest, shiniest buildings in your town are hospitals. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's the food. And I think that's the name of your show, isn't it? It's, it's all, all about, about food. food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to ask you about oil. Okay. Um, many people, when I talk about not consuming oil, are quite surprised. In fact, I have a very dear friend with me in the studio right now. She just arrived from the south of France, oh. and I told her what we're going to be talking about, and one of the things is oil. Can you talk about sure. oil? Or oil is essential for human health, but it's delivered in packages like oranges and potatoes and rice and corn. And what uh, people have been doing for quite a while, see, oil doesn't exist in a free form in nature. You have to process the food to get the oil out. Mm. So what people have been doing for a long time is they've been taking corn and olives and nuts and so on, and they've been processing them and squeezing the oil out, and now they have isolated oil. This is not food. 
This is isolated fat. There's no protein, no sugar, no vitamins, no minerals. It's just isolated fat. No fiber. No nothing. It's just oil. And so they process it out of the food, and now it becomes at best a medication and at worst a serious toxin, poison. And uh, your friend, I'd ask, I don't know what she looks like, but she's right there in the studio with you, as I would tell her that one of the... She's slim and lovely. Oh, good. Well, (laughs) if she wasn't, then it may be more meaningful. But one of the mantras I teach my patients is, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And the most efficient thing the body can do with oil is just move it from the fork and spoon to your body fat. Mm. And it does it so efficiently, it doesn't even change the chemical structure of the fat. So if I biopsy your butt or your thigh or your abdomen and analyze that fat in your body, I can tell what you like to eat. If I analyze it and it's full of omega-3 fats, I know you're a big fish eater. If it's full of monounsaturated fat, then olive oil is your preference. Mm. If it's full of margarine are full of trans fats, and I, I know you're eating margarines. So you can tell but, the difference between a coconut butt or a fish yeah, butt? Yeah, so, so to speak. <laughs> uh, it, it is not that, uh, that simple, but you like, for example, people who eat dairy. There's a particular chemical structure where the double bonds are placed at the carbon 15 and 17 position. So if I biopsied somebody's butt fat, I like that, uh, and took it to the lab and analyzed it, and I saw a lot of C- C15, C17 fats in their body fat. I know they're really into cheese and mm. milk and things like that. So, yeah, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Wow. And the other thing you should know is that uh, good fats, like they're called omega-3 fats, uh, they're very powerful drugs. They thin the blood, cause bleeding problems. They suppress the immune system, increase your risk of infection, and dramatically uh, promote cancer growth. And then the omega-6 fats, which were like safflower oil and corn oil, they were highly touted about 30, 40 years ago to prevent heart disease. You know, we took out animal fat and replaced it with polyunsaturated fats. Well, these were omega-6 fats. And now these days, analyzing the data from the studies done 40 years ago, we see that those who went to the good omega-6 fats have more heart disease, more damaged arteries than those who stayed on the butter. So these oils are dangerous. Uh, They make you fat. Uh, They uh, cause type 2 diabetes. Uh, They damage the arteries. They change the immune system when they're isolated. Now, when they're in the food, in the orange, the banana, et cetera, they're not only perfectly fine, they're necessary. Okay, two quick questions. You said um, those studies showed that butter was better than omega-6 oils. Yeah, omega-6, right. Yeah, there were studies done, uh, like the Finney's Mental Health Study, and a whole bunch of, of uh, randomized, well-controlled trials that they did in the 1970s uh, when they believed that the answer was to switch from uh, saturated fat animals. In other words, saturated fat means, uh, means uh, meat, dairy, and eggs. That's synonymous. So they could see, based upon all kinds of uh, epidemiologic data and thousands of animal uh, experiments that uh, eating saturated fat or animal fat uh, plugged the arteries and so they cause heart disease and strokes. So the researchers back then, 40 years ago, decided they'll set up, the, set up these controlled trials and they'll take the animal fat out and replace it with safflower oil or corn oil, uh, with oils, you know. And uh, they saw more cancer, more gallbladder disease in the oil con- consuming groups and Oh, over the last couple of years, several journals, including the British Medical Journal, have, put, have uh, published follow-up results of those experiments where they used these omega-6 oils and showing that the, the damage to the arteries was horrible and uh, worse heart disease and so on than leaving them on the animal fat. So the point being is you want to eat oil, but you want to eat it in the form of, uh, of a bowl of rice or a bowl of beans. Or, you know, don't, don't eat it as an isolated, concentrated ingredient. It's toxic. Mm. Okay. I got you. Thank you. I, I really like the way you pointed out a number of things in the book that I, I just wanted to mention. One, which I never realized, I talk about on the show and with many people over the decades about protein, calcium, and omega-3 oils. Mm. I never made the connection, kind of how they've been marketed, so mm. we... We think of animal food as protein, we think of milk as calcium, and we think of fish as omega-3 oils. And it's a very limited and not a very good way to 
think of those nutrients, and we forget about all the other nutrients that are so important. Well, this is just business at its worst. Uh, well, these industries, the meat industry, the dairy industry, and so on, they're just doing the same thing as the car industry and you know your lipstick manufacturer or whatever. Uh, they're doing something called unique positioning. What you do is you find something unique about your product and you advertise it, you know, big time to the death of your customers to, in this case. So the, when I mention uh, protein, people automatically say meat, dairy, and eggs. Well, that's that concept that was created by those industries because there has never, ever in all of human history or scientific research ever been a case of protein deficiency ever reported. It's non-existent unless you're starving to death and then everything's deficient. Uh, likewise, if I mention calcium, the dairy industry has worked for 80 years to try and make the connection of their product, which is high in calcium, to good health. But there's never been a case of calcium deficiency ever reported on any natural diet in all of human history. So, uh, you know, they uniquely position a an ingredient in their food However, there's no disease related to not eating that food. Uh, it's just so bizarre, it's hard to believe, uh, unless you study it. But it's just business. They're not trying to hurt you. This is not a conspiracy. They just want you to buy their, you know, their, their beef or their pig or their you know, chicken or whatever. That's all they're trying to do. They're just acting like all human beings do. And then the third point is omega-3 fats and fish. Uh, no animal can desaturate it at the carbon-3 position. Uh, you just cannot, no animal can create omega-3 fats. So only plants do that. If a fish has omega-3 fats, it's because it ate algae mm. or some other s- seaweed, uh, because only plants can, can make that particular chemical change, which is to make a double bond at the three position. Uh, but anyway, that, that's what they do. They just do business, and the result is your children are fat and constipated and sick and you know, your female spouses are dying of breast and uterine cancer, and your male spouses are dying of heart attacks, and everybody in the family is fat and sick, and, and you're paying, you know, you're paying four times as much for your food as you should be because you're eating all their expensive garbage, you know, whereas you could be living on on rice, which you can get for, uh, for about 25 bucks for 50 pounds, and <laughs> beans you can get, you know, 20 pounds for $14, and potatoes you can get 20 pounds for $9 at Costco. Uh, so they're, they're ripping you off uh you know, they're killing you, they're stealing your money. They basically they're criminals. Criminals right. yeah, they're they're basically criminals that are getting away with it and yep. nobody can stop them because they have all the money. And there's a lot of medical malpractice that's going on just either from ignorance or Um we could do a, a ten more shows. Uh, yeah, on that. I know. <laughs> okay. I wanna ask you about supplements. So you promote using B twelve, but you don't recommend taking vitamin D? Well, a B12 is, is uh, the only uh, the only nutrient that I recommend people add back, and it's a long story. Uh, there, are, you know, if you don't eat B12 and you're a, a strict vegan, your chance of having a disease-related B12 deficiency is probably less than one in a million. But I, I you know, I just to avoid the subject, I've always recommended B12. But the whole D story, I'd like to spend my time on is uh, vitamin D, as all of you old enough to remember, comes from the sun. And it always did, always will. The action of sunlight on various sterols in your skin makes the vitamin D through a whole bunch of processes, so the kidney and the liver and so on. Well, that's where it's supposed to come from, is to get sun. Well, things, things happen. Uh, maybe... 30 years ago, uh, researchers noticed that uh, as people moved away from the equator, they had lower vitamin D levels in their blood, and they also had more heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, obesity, etc. So what they said is, well, it must be a lack of vitamin D that's causing these diseases because as you go away from the equator, you have less less, uh, ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation exposed to you, that's true, but also as you move away from the equator, populations eat more meat and dairy and less starch, and that's really the true factor. But anyway, to get to the bottom end of the story, what happened is this became one of the biggest cases of disease mongering in all of medical history. Disease mongering is turning people into patients. 
So what uh, the doctors and the laboratories and the supplement industry did is they went out and encouraged everybody to check their D levels. Well, 9 out of 10 people flunked the vitamin D test uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they don't get enough sun. The other is they're chronically ill. And one of the results of chronic illness and chronic inflammation is it suppresses D levels. But anyway, uh, the, res- the bottom line is that uh, everybody's taking vitamin D. That rate, when I say everybody, I, I would say half of my patients. Uh, mm-hmm. So they're taking vitamin D. It raises their vitamin D levels. However, the outcomes, which you're looking for, the positive outcomes, uh, are not there. In fact, it's negative. Uh, three major studies have been published in the last uh, five years that show when you supplement people with vitamin D, either by pills or injections, all three major studies, and there aren't any other ones, so you can, you can go look for them if you want, but they, these are randomized controlled trials. <clears throat> they all show that those who take the supplement have an increased risk of falls and fractures because the vitamin D is unnatural. You know, mm. you're supposed to get it from the sun, and it uh, causes nutritional imbalances that lead to, lead to nerve and muscle problems and more falls. and It's just a bad deal, but it's a big business. Wow. I need to read those studies, and uh, I'm kind of, kind of fascinated about this because uh, you're the only one I've heard this from. Well, go to my March 2015 newsletter at drmcdougall.com, and you'll see two of the studies discussed. And then the, since I wrote that March 2015 newsletter, uh, JAMA Internal Medicine came out with a third. So you can find the three studies. There, there, are, there are no other large, well-done studies that show otherwise. Uh, researchers, scientists, uh, people who take the trouble to read the science know what the truth is. And uh, unfortunately, it's not profitable. So you know, the truth gets told through the eyes of the financial accountants. <laughs> so what if you're eating the healthiest diet on earth and you get a reasonable amount of sun and you have low levels of vitamin D? Well, then, it, it, well, first of all, you, you, uh, reasonable amounts of sun. A very white person like I am, uh, you can make all your vitamin D at a latitude of Boston by exposing my hands and cheeks to five minutes of sunshine at noon at noon three times a week. Mm-hmm. That's all you need. Yeah. Now, if you're a darker person, you need more darker skinned. Uh, so uh, you know you, you should get sun. It's extremely important, but you don't need a lot. Uh, more is better to a point to the point where you start damaging your skin. You don't want to do that. And uh, the other thing you can do is you can stop your diseases of chronic inflammation, which is you become chronically inflamed by consuming animal foods and not consuming vegetable foods and grains, which is contrary to what you're told. But if you want to see the major studies, I, I, you know, I put those studies in the, in the healthiest diet on the planet. Yes, I have a whole two pages of the studies that clearly show that eating animal foods causes tremendous inflammation in the body, and eating uh, plant foods does exactly the opposite. And those who say otherwise don't have any research on their side to prove it except for some uh, convoluted uh, interpretation of uh, some extremely weak evidence. They're lying. They're placing a plain and simple lying. So just go out, get some sun, go for a walk, and eat a starch-based diet, and likely most of your problems will go away, and you'll get off your blood pressure pills and your diabetic pills, and your bowels will work, and your indigestion will stop, <laughs> and you can play with your grandkids, and whatever. It's, not, it's really that simple. And life is good. I have one, good. one last question. The title uh, of your book, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. Now, I know a lot of books are going with sensational titles today to yeah. get people's attention. Is this indeed the healthiest diet on uh, the planet? That diet, that title was brought to me by uh, uh, by my editor, and uh, yes, it is the healthiest diet on the planet. It's the diet that ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people who have walked planet Earth have consumed, as we talked about. You know, people are starch eaters, so it is the healthiest diet on the planet without a question. It's the diet that almost everybody who's lived on planet Earth has eaten, and uh, I think it's a very catchy title. I think it's absolutely true. Uh, I know other people make certain claims, but if you just open your eyes and look at the things that you and I have talked about for the last few minutes, you can see that. You can see that Grandma and Grandpa, who came from Africa, they had no hemorrhoids. They had no gallbladder disease. They had 
no heart disease, no breast cancer, yet African Americans today are horribly diseased with cancer and obesity and heart disease. It has nothing to do with your genetics. It has to do with the change of a diet from a starch-based diet, which they ate in rural Africa, a diet of corn and beans and root vegetables and so on, to moving to New York City and uh, uh, eating a diet high in meat and oil, animal foods and oil. I mean, this is not rocket science. Every single one of your listeners, if they just stop for a minute and they just look around and open their eyes and think about their experience, they go, oh, my goodness, this is so stupid. And where do you make money teaching people this? Mm. That's the problem. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. McDougall, I want to thank you very much for joining me, and I also want to take a moment to thank your wife, Mary. The Uh, recipes in the back look great, and you talk about eating potatoes and rice and corn. You can eat them plain, and they're great, but she's put together many wonderful recipes that make those foods even more delicious and fascinating and fun. Well, I will tell her that, and I'll give her a big hug, too. Okay, yeah, please give her a hug for me, and I'm giving you a hug, too. Thank you again, Dr. McDougall, the healthiest diet on the planet. We're back. I'm Karen Hartglass. Thanks for joining me for the second part of today's program. And I want to get right to it with my guest, Stephen M. Wise. He is the president of the Non-Human Rights Project. He holds a JD from Boston University Law School and a BS in chemistry from the College of William and Mary. He has practiced animal protection law for 30 years throughout the United States and is admitted to the Massachusetts Bar. Steve teaches animal rights jurisprudence at the Vermont Lewis and Clark University of Miami and St. Thomas Law Schools, and he has taught animal rights law at the Harvard Law School and John Marshall Law School. He's the author of four books. Rattling the Cage, Drawing the Line, Through the Heavens May Fall, and my favorite, an American trilogy, Death, Slavery, and Dominion Along the Banks of the Cape Fear River. He is also working on a fifth, which will be a memoir about the Non-Human Rights Project. Welcome to It's All About Food. Stephen, how are you today? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome, and I hope you had a very happy birthday yesterday. I did, yes. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So I had the opportunity to meet you a few weeks ago you were speaking in brooklyn and it was great to hear you in person i want to uh, what what impressed me the most i don't know why i just realized it at that point in time when you were speaking but how you are working to move the law in such a tiny increment and I was just fascinated by that and your approach and your patience. Can you talk a little about that work? Uh, sure. It, indeed, I, I I do have a lot of patience. I'm very persistent. Um, I had uh, begun working as an animal protection lawyer in 1980, 1981. And by 19, and, uh, I, I began working with uh, what became the Animal Legal Defense Fund. I became president of that for, for 10 years. And... By 1985, 1986, I'd been uh, persuaded that uh, it was it was there was a real problem with respect to how the law dealt with non-human animals. That they the uh, the law saw them all as legal things, which may, which means that they they lacked the capacity to have any kind of legal rights, or, as opposed to legal persons, which is the capacity to have <clears throat> to have at least some legal rights. And that until <clears throat> non-human animals uh, were seen as persons. Uh, they could be expected to be treated just like human beings treat all their other property. Uh, they they don't act in the interest of their property. They act in their in in their own interests. And essentially, a person is the master of things. Things are slaves to us persons. And so I began to uh, plan uh, how we would begin to move at least some non-human animals from the legal category of things. <clears throat> Again, who lack the capacity for any kind of legal right to legal persons who have the capacity uh, for at least some. And, and the ones we're looking for are those that protect uh, their most fundamental interests. And at that time, I thought it would take 1985, 86. I thought it would take about 30 years of preparation uh, before we'd be able to even file the first lawsuits that had some kind of a reasonable chance of success. And and uh, there was so much to do because if you, if you can go back to 1985, there was no, there was very few, few, there was very little talk of animal rights in any kind of a technical legal way 
Uh, there weren't very many lawyers. There were no case books. There were no law schools who taught it. Uh, there were no law review articles about it. Uh, there were no organizations except the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And also, the world was in a very different place with respect to um, non-human animals. And I, I, so altogether, I figured it would take uh, probably 30 years before the world had turned, and we had prepared uh, for those kinds of cases. And it did indeed take 28 years. That, wow. um, uh, that uh, 1985 is when I began, and then the Non-Human Rights Project began filing its first series of lawsuits on behalf of chimpanzees in the state of New York, habeas corpus lawsuits, uh, in December of 2013. Hmm. That's a lot of patience and a lot of wonderful foresight. So thank you for getting started that so long ago. Well, uh, th- you know, there's, a, um, there's a film out about us called Unlocking the Cage by um, Chris Hedges and D.A. Pennybaker. I remember going in and speaking with them uh, about whether or not, and they're trying to figure out whether they're going to shoot the film, and they wanted to see me, and I thought they probably want to see whether I'm a lunatic or whether <laughs> or whether uh, whether that you know I'm, I'm I'm serious about this because if you say someone had an idea and it's going to take them 28 years before they can move on it, uh, you could either be a lunatic or you could be somebody who's deadly serious. And uh, I think they realized soon that I was deadly serious, and they agreed to make the film. And and indeed, uh, it took four years to make and. It premiered at the Sundance Film, Film Festival in January, and now it's been playing around the world, and it's going on HBO on, on February 20th. Well, congratulations, and I look forward to seeing it. I remember when it came here to New York, and unfortunately, I was in California for a good amount of that time, so I missed it when it was here, and I look forward to seeing it in February. I'm going to have oh, to find wonderful. somebody who has HBO. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. But I think I can do that. All right. So you've expanded the mission of the Non-Human Rights Project. Can you talk about that? Yes. Well, we, we originally were, were planning on, on uh, just filing lawsuits, uh, and specifically we, we began by, by filing hideous corpus lawsuits on behalf of captive chimpanzees. Um, we've begun uh, moving that to uh, filing other sorts of lawsuits um, uh, with, in, in, in states other than the state of New York on behalf of other animals. So our, our next lawsuit um, will uh, be, on, be on behalf of elephants in a, in a, in a circus. Uh, we have a lawsuit after that. We'll probably go after um, chimpanzees being used in entertainment, uh, where we always have an idea. We're looking at, at, at SeaWorld in San Diego and trying to figure out how we may be able to file lawsuits against SeaWorld. But we're also moving into the um, uh, legislative department, not at the state level or the federal level, but uh, we've been working on uh, how to try to get ordinances passed that would make certain non-human animals legal persons who have the capacity for rights at the municipal level, at the county level, or at the city level, uh, at the town level. And uh, uh, so we're beginning to do that. Um, we're beginning to get more deeply into a public education program. Uh, basically, so that we, we can continue to um, make people understand why we're doing what we're doing. And also, we think that will make it easier for us to win at the legislative level as well as in front of judges because they'll have a much better idea as to, from a legal point of view, why we're doing what we're doing. But also, we never do anything on behalf of a non-human animal that we haven't uh, already lined up uh, the world's great experts in that in the cognition of that non-human animal, and so uh, they will then uh, judges, legislators, and, and others will be able to to really get an idea as to what kind of of extraordinary mind so many of these non-human animals have. And we're we're beginning to focus. Uh, we, we we focus first on the great apes, uh, chimpanzees, uh, bonobos. Uh, gorillas and orangutans, also on Indian and, and, and um, I'm sorry, Asian and African elephants, uh, as well as some dolphins and whales. Those are the non-human animals so, uh, who we're starting with. And one of the reasons we're starting um, with them is because there is so much known about their minds that they, it's clear that they have these extraordinarily complex minds. And uh, we want uh, other people to, to, to understand what we understand by um, getting all sorts of facts together, lining up experts, and 
letting people know, uh, you know, what kind of beings we're living with on this planet. Something that fascinated me when I heard you speak in Brooklyn as well is talking about the law and how you can make changes in the law, kind of how it builds on itself. And right now, a lot of us are feeling a lot of despair uh, because of the future of the federal government with the man who will be president very soon and who he's choosing to be part of his cabinet and staff. And it's it's somewhat scary. And, and some of us are thinking that our civil rights are going to be taken away to some degree. But you're you're focusing on working on the state level, and now you're talking about the municipal level. And tell me why that's important. Well, I think it's it, it's important because first of all, they're independent. Um, we 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 work on uh, state common law actually, and the common law is the law that judges make while they're in the process of de- deciding cases, and. It doesn't have anything to do with federal law at all. So any, there could be a lot of things going on at the federal level that would not affect us because we're working at the common law level, which and, – and the common law has been around for eight or 900 years. And it, it, it slowly changes, but it's, it's made to be flexible, to change um, according to how the public, public experience changes, public mores change, uh, how scientific facts continue to accrue. And so the arguments – we have been making and continue to make at the common law level, we'll continue to make no matter who's sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court or who's sitting in, um, who's, who's sitting on the federal benches. Um, at the municipal level, uh, we're actually looking at those states that have so-called constitutional home rule, which means that within their state constitutions, there are provisions that allow them to legislate in a way that they cannot be overridden at the state level. And they're, so they're, they're almost like little states themselves. The cities and towns within that state have the power of, of the state. And so we, we want to go into to make our arguments at, at, a, at a smaller level, like a county level or city level, as well as making common law arguments at the state level. Um, we, think it's, um, we think it's the way to really get our feet, our foot into the door. And so mm-hmm. that's why we've chosen that. Um, once you go to the federal level, you're dealing with um, either federal statutes, which there are very, very few federal statutes that protect non-human animals, uh, or you're dealing with um, federal courts who rarely have jurisdiction over non-human animal issues. Uh, so we think starting at the uh, state level and the uh, municipal level is the way that we want to we want to begin. Can you tell us what's going on around the world on this subject? I, I think there's yes. some positive things that have been happening. I can tell you. Yes, one of the, 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 the uh, non-human rights project um, might be working at the municipal level and the state level, and we skip our federal level, but we go we skip right up to the international level. <laughs> uh, or and so we we have been working uh, slowly with um, lawyers in I think probably ten countries now. Uh, uh, in um, uh, France, in England, Switzerland, uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, Argentina, Brazil, uh, India, Australia, New, New Zealand, uh, trying to um, impart whatever whatever help we can give to them to try to get legal rights for non-human animals, uh, and working with them to so we, we we can share whatever experience we have, and we may be able to learn from them as well, and. I think the the uh, country where we're having the most success is Argentina, uh, and uh, there was a case about two months ago uh, where a chimp in Mendoza, Argentina, where a chimpanzee named Cecilia was also the subject of a writ of habeas corpus uh, that was really modeled on our our work, uh, and the the arguments made about the um, Cognition of the of Cecilia, a chimpanzee, was also modeled on our work, so we were really happy to see that. And also, I had spent a week down in uh, Buenos Aires and Bahia Blanca in, in Argentina in May, speaking with lawyers. So I, I, I knew how eager people were to be able to push this sort of thing forward. Uh, so a judge then did indeed grant a writ of habeas corpus and uh, and ordered a chimpanzee named Cecilia to be taken from the 
Mendoza Zoo and sent to a sanctuary in Brazil. And so I think that's really the first time at least that that um, a writ of habeas corpus has has been used successfully all the way. We we have been successful. We 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 we've had a, a judge in Manhattan um, issue a writ of habeas corpus, or in, in New York they would call it an order to show cause. Uh, that ha- that was the first time that it happened in the world, uh, and that required Stony Brook, who was imprisoning two chimpanzees named Hercules and Leos, to actually come into court <laughs> and defend for the first time in history their their imprisonment of a non-human animal. Uh, when we we had the habeas corpus hearing, the judge uh, ruled in our favor all the way down the line, except for one thing. She felt bound by a previous ruling in another part of New York that had gone against us. And so she said, uh, uh, I'm going to have to deny your writ of habeas corpus, quote, for now, un- unquote. And now um, we're actually going into an appellate court in New York City in January on behalf of Tommy the chimpanzee and the same appellate court in February on behalf of Kiko the chimpanzee uh, trying to uh, persuade that court uh, to tell the judge who had ruled against us uh, that she doesn't have to pay attention to that other case that that case was decided wrongly. So you keep chipping away and oh, yeah. these, these judges look for kind of an excuse because they they don't have the courage to rule well, in favor of your judges. Um, uh, judges case. You know, they're, they're not they're not all cut from the same cloth. You know, some judges are very conservative. Some judges are much more liberal. Uh, some are willing to have their picture on the front page of newspapers. Some are not willing to have their picture on the front page yeah. of newspapers. And um, they're, they're, there's a very there's they're broad and diverse kinds of judges and so uh, we really can't pick the ones we're going in front of and so we kind of uh, we kind of make our arguments in front of the judges we get and uh, even in the first three years we you know we've gotten a wide variety of judges and some judges we've done um, much better in front of than than others so uh, in fact when you watch the film which by the way is called Un- unlocking the cage you can watch one or two judges kind of ring me out about what I'm <laughs> trying to do and then you can find other judges who are very, very sympathetic to it. And it, you know, it's just kind of how, how they're made, you know, what, what their value systems are. Um, and also what kind of a case they think we're filing. For example, do they think we're, we're filing a property case because of chimpanzee's property? Or do they think we're filing a civil rights case because we're asking for a legal right for a non-human animal? So. We think a, a judge who's some, who kind of intuitively believes that, that, that she has a property case in front of her is going to rule against us, while a judge who kind of intuitively thinks that she has a civil rights case in front of her uh, may tend to rule in our favor. So there, um, we, uh, we have an immense amount of patience, and we just uh, apply as much pressure as we can. Uh, we also speak to our brothers and sisters in the legal profession uh, by uh, continuing to write and, and publish series of law review articles in which we explain at much greater length the legal arguments that we're using in our cases uh, so that uh, uh, judges and lawyers and, uh, and law clerks can, can read them and understand what we're doing. And it's also something that we can cite to in our briefs. And, again, the judges or their clerks can go to these articles and get a better understanding than they might be able to get even by reading our briefs because there, there's always a page limit on our briefs, but there's not really a page limit on our books or law review articles, um, an oral argument in front of a judge may end up taking you know 15 minutes. So there's not a whole lot that you can really you know talk about in uh, 15 minutes. So I'm just I'm just curious our uh, and our about I'm curious about Stony Brook and what their argument was to keep these animals imprisoned. Well, I'm afraid I I'm not really clear what 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 it is sometimes. Um, you, you you can watch the lawyer for Stony Brook, who is an assistant attorney general. You know, make the arguments. I I think the most I, I think the most important arguments were one, number one, judge, this has never been done before. You shouldn't do it now. Number, and that's the argument that anybody makes who wants to keep the status quo. When someone else comes in and says, hey, it's time uh, because of new scientific evidence or or changes in the law, it's time it's time to move something in a different direction. The person doesn't want to move will say, 
hey, we don't know what's going to happen. We shouldn't be doing this. That kind of argument they make all the time. And then they make the another kind of argument, which in law is known as the slippery slope, which is, judge, if you uh, if you uh, give a writ of ha- if if you grant habeas corpus to a chimpanzee and and get her out of her cell and put her on a in, in a sanctuary, well, that means then uh, you're going to then chimpanzees are going to want to come in and they want and they're going to want to vote and they're going to want to go to college. They're going to want to get married and then <laughs> and. Uh, and so, you know, you shouldn't start down this dangerous trail. It's the slippery slope. And the judge, in, actually, in her opinion, in, in the Stony Brook case, specifically addressed this slippery slope argument and said, I don't buy it. If the party in front of me is entitled to justice, he'll get it. And, and then if and we'll let the next judge decide the next case, which I think is is the appropriate answer to a slippery slope argument. Okay. Steve, this is difficult this work. This is challenging work. This is time-consuming work. It costs money. How can we help? What can people do? Well, if you, if you would like to donate to us, you're certainly, uh, you can go to our website, which is www.nonhumanrights.org, and you'll find a donate button. And also, uh, you'll, uh, you will find that Everything that we file or everything an opponent files or everything a judge does, everything, whether we like it or not, goes up on our website. Um, we're also, also the website that you see in December is not going to be the website that's going to go up in January because we're, we're spending money to really change our whole website to, to make it much, much easier for people to follow. And also, if you're interested in just working anywhere in the United States, really anywhere in the world, uh, for for the same sorts of things that the non-human rights project is interested in. Um, we are expanding. We're beginning to actually um, put people in, in into um, uh, district uh, captains kind of in, in each state. And so uh, we'll be able to talk with you, not right now, but by March or April, we'll be able to talk to you about what you might be able to do to help our work uh, in the state in which you are living. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen hey, M. Wise, so much for the non-human me on. rights. Yes, thank you for for keeping it up for so many decades, doing what you're doing. Um, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. How awesome is that for someone to be working for the voiceless and improving the legal rights for those who are sentient and are smart? and cannot represent themselves in our legal system, which is so abusive to them. That's the show for today, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Dr. John McDougall and Stephen M. Wise, the world is a better place because both of you have lived. Thank you. Everybody, have a delicious week. Mm